Mark Driscoll says that God is a sinner. In the quote I'm about to play, Driscoll says that God or the Holy Spirit, God the Holy Spirit, works in the hearts of unbelievers for a period of time before faith. In other words, the Spirit doesn't first give the man the truth and the knowledge and the understanding of Christ and the gospel, but for a long could be a long period of time before faith and knowledge, um, the Holy Spirit somehow works in an unbeliever. This raises an issue because everything an unbeliever does is sinful. According to Romans 8 verse 8, those in the flesh cannot please God. And secondly, the Proverbs say that even the plowing of the wicked is sin. And even the way a wicked man treats his animals is sin. So everything an unbeliever does down to coughing, walking around, everything is sin because it's not done out of the spirit of thankfulness to God, but out of, you know, pride, selfishness, trying to establish a righteousness of their own. So apparently some of these unbelievers have God's Holy Spirit in them, yet they continually, everything they do is works of works of iniquity um, done through lusts of the devil the devil rules their hearts and so on these are all the scripture says um, but driscoll says that the holy spirit's in there so i guess the holy spirit's working this sin throughout them now i acknowledge that god causes everything um, is there is a calamity in a city that god has not done amos says and god works all things according to the counsel of his will according to ephesians however god um, God, the Holy Spirit, when we read about him in the scripture, he is causes the fruits of righteousness, of love, peace, the fruits of the spirit. But to say that the Holy Spirit is doing a good thing when he's working sin through unbelievers in order to make them saved. Um, this is what Driscoll says. I can't see any other way, um, but to say that Driscoll thinks that God is a sinner which is pretty much consistent with a lot of the other things he says that unbelievers should pray before they're saved. In other words, I have to call Driscoll a minister of sin because he's getting unbelievers to pray their way into salvation. And since an unbeliever's prayer is sin, um, because their plowing is sin as well, everything they do is sin because it's not done out of a spirit of thanks and gratitude for the work of Christ. Instead, it's done out of a spirit of self-righteousness, of trying to seek a righteousness of their own. Um, Therefore, Driscoll is actually exhorting unbelievers to sin their way into salvation. Um, Here's what he says. Some of you know the Lord Jesus and you have tasted this joy. Some of you are here today and you will give your lives to Jesus and you will become Christians today. And what John tells you is this, you are in the process of completing our joy. Our joy is full and good, but it's not complete yet. Because there's still people that God loves that haven't met Him yet. There are still people that Jesus is pursuing. And He's been at work in your heart and in your life. He has been pursuing you faithfully and graciously and patiently. And He has not given up on you because of His affection for you. And when you give yourself to Him and you stop resisting Him and you, you, you embrace Jesus as He has embraced you and you respond to Him in that way, our joy will be complete. Hmm. So... Driscoll thinks that perhaps an unbeliever showing a humility, I don't know what you call it, um, they guilt something an unbeliever says he's feeling. Um, a Driscoll might say that, well, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit doesn't convict men of the truth of Jesus, that he's finished the work. No, a Holy, the Holy Spirit doesn't bother with that first. He ignores the most important thing of all, the gospel and makes the unbeliever feel all kinds of things about guiltiness, and um, the unbeliever focusing on himself, and oh, I'm so terrible, not focusing on Christ, his atonement, and I mean, I don't even know, how can an unbeliever know what sin is, until he understands what Christ had to do on the cross? What I find particularly disturbing, is that the scripture actually says, the Holy Spirit does not testify of his own works, he testifies solely of Christ's work. Yet, Driscoll makes the Holy Spirit into a liar by thinking that some kind of previous work in the heart, whatever that is, I don't know what he calls it, something apart from the truth of Christ or the word of God in a man's heart, 
um, that that is what prepares a man for salvation. So apparently the Holy Spirit convicts a man of something else in Christ's work, contrary to what the Bible says, that the Spirit speaks not of himself, he speaks solely of Christ. In the next quote from Mark Driscoll, he says that there's no reason why an unbeliever can't be saved. But then he completely contradicts himself and says that in order to be saved, an unbeliever has to give themselves to Christ. It's kind of double talk, isn't it? You say, well, God, Christ has done everything. God is true. You don't need to do anything to be saved. There's nothing stopping you from being saved. But then to say, well, hang on, if you want to accelerate the process of salvation, why don't you do this, pray, why don't you do that and follow Christ or forsake, your, forsake yourself? Um, it's quite double talk to say nothing's needed, but then hang, hang on, there's a whole list of requirements you need to fulfill before you can be saved. Here's what Driscoll has to say. So what would keep you non-Christians from becoming Christians today? What would prevent you from receiving Jesus as God? Your God. What would prevent you from receiving Jesus? There is no reason. There is no reason that none of us today should walk away without giving ourselves to Jesus, beginning with our sin. Lord Jesus, here are my sins. Thank you for your death and resurrection and forgiveness so that now I can be friends with you and friends with others. Driscoll would really make a good salesman, wouldn't he? He'd convince you that something is free, but then you'd read at the bottom of the page in the small fine print all the terms and conditions. So Driscoll says there's no reason an unbeliever can't be saved. But then you look into it and read the fine print and the unbeliever has to forsake sin. The unbeliever has to commit himself. Or as I quote Driscoll in another video, he says that we need to be have a heartfelt commitment in order to be saved. He never specifies how heartfelt we have to be. He's a bit vague about the requirements of salvation. But either way, whether Driscoll's vague or specific at times about what we need to do to be saved, it always destroy, destroys assurance because the scripture says, if any man thinks he stands or is confident, let him beware lest he falls. In other words, if you think your own righteousness is sufficient, beware because God requires perfection. Only Christ's righteousness satisfies God. To conclude with a few scriptures, um, in Romans 10, it says, Isaiah is very bold and says, I was found of them not seeking me. I became known to them, not inquiring after me. So salvation is completely, conversion is a complete radical change of mind that's unexpected, that wasn't sought after at all. Because you can't seek after the perfect righteousness of Christ. It comes to men who are completely ignorant of the truth, who are deluded by Satan. Secondly, Isaiah 30 says, And your ears shall hear a word behind you, saying, This is the way, walk you in it. So again, we see the image of a man pursuing one path, and salvation being complete surprise that nothing was actually required of him all along, nothing at all except the righteousness of Jesus Christ and his atoning blood. And finally, when we actually see an example of a sinner seeking salvation, so to say, when we look at Paul, in Philippians 3, 6-9, if you get a chance to read it, you'll see that he was seeking a righteousness of his own. He was seeking to also kill Christians and so on. And in 1, 1 Timothy 1, Paul is mentioned to be a pattern for all the saints. So there's never been a, an elect person in the history of the world who has ever found and sought after God or endeavored to be saved through prayer or commitment or whatever. Like Paul, they've all been seeking a righteousness of their own, but have been found by God and given the knowledge of the truth as a pleasant surprise. And can a person go from total ignorance of God to be... Yeah, as a brute beast, as Jude 1.10 says, can they go from being a brute beast, completely ignorant, as ignorant as an animal is, then to understanding the glory of God and having the light shine in their mind? Could they ever then go in doubt that they're saved? Can a man go from complete darkness to the light, from blindness to sight, and ever think, oh, am I, am I seeing now? Of course not. So full assurance is a privilege of all believers.